people that haven't heard about lab-grown diamonds or really don't know what they are are, are really stuck in an old mindset. And, and you know what? This is one of those product categories where monthly the yes. numbers are changing. Laboratory grown diamond or a created diamond is uh, chemically, physically, optically, atomically the same as the diamond mined from the earth. Hello. Hey, how are you? Oh, hey, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can just jump into it. I mean, first of all, this has been a long time coming. I mean, I can't believe... I can't believe it's taken this long to get you. I know you've been really busy. Last week was crazy. I mean, I don't know if you saw, well, we, I, I guess you did see, we were in the in the Daily Mail and it was it was great, but it was just super hectic. We had to do so much work and, and I guess, you know, even the weekend I had to work, but I love it. So, so it's great. Right. Fresh off being profiled in the Daily Mail just last week, the Diamond Disruptor podcast presents a talk with Lark and Barry founder Laura Chavez for the first time on our show. After a hectic week following her coverage in the Daily Mail, Laura finally got the chance to join me for this Zoom call. The Mail piece online now is called How Lab-Grown Diamonds Became Every Girl's Best Friend, Far More Ethical, and Even a Top Expert Can't Tell the Difference. Well, I think it just got us attention overall because it, um, it, it's, it has a high readership. So I think a lot more people learned about the option of cultured diamonds. And I call them cultured because I really don't like the term lab grown. I think it sounds a little bit sterile. And, you know, we're not really selling medicine. We're selling you something beautiful, shiny, you know, set on gold. So so that's why when I say cultured, I mean, you know, the grown diamonds. So I just think it raised a lot of awareness that this was now an option. You know, the fact that you can get a diamond that's you know, identical to a mined diamond, but you don't have to mine for it and you can grow it and it's not going to cost you an arm and a leg. And I just, I like the term cultured because when we are growing the diamonds, we're growing them to put them on a beautiful piece of jewelry. So, so in a way you are, you know, you're growing them with love. And I think that's important. And also people know that Pearls can also be cultured. So that's also a really easy way to understand. You know, they can grow your pearls and now we can actually grow and culture your diamonds as well. Yeah, the worst term, I mean, has got to be synthetic. And what's interesting, even still, and I don't know if it's different in the UK, because, you know, depending on where you are territory wise, when you're using the internet and using Wikipedia, <clears throat> when you look up cultured diamonds here on the U- in the US on Wikipedia, they're still listed under synthetic diamonds. Yeah. And I, and I, you know, that's, that's a really old term. And, and I think it's before people realized or, or just not know that the diamonds are actually real, because when you say something like, oh, we have synthetic leather, it's not real leather, right? It's just like a type of something that resembles leather. Whereas when you are talking about diamonds, they're a hundred percent real. The only difference is really how they're grown. So, you know, instead of growing under a mine, in a mine, and then you mine them to get them out, you're growing them in, in a lab with, a, with some really cool tech. They're optically, chemically, physically, you know, they're, they're, they're just as the mine diamonds. Isn't it, wasn't it true here, at least, that the Federal Trade Commission used to, used to make you all call them synthetic, and then they finally passed something that, that you know, acknowledged? No, so actually what the FTC did say was that you know, the mine diamond people cannot use the term synthetic to make it seem like the diamonds aren't real because they are real diamonds, right? So that was actually a really good move on their part. And I think for for all consumers to actually know that these are real diamonds, they're not synthetic. But when it comes to diamonds, we have been contacted by people in, in different diamond organizations where right. they're telling us that, you know, you should use this term and not this term because, you know, the consumer doesn't understand. And what I've told them is when we talk about our diamonds, when we advertise them, when we go to press, we always tell them our diamonds are not mined. You know, they've never been mined. And that is what we're trying to tell customers. And and no one has ever been confused about that. You know, there's a lot of people that are selling two types of diamonds, mined and not mined. And and I see where that could get confusing. But with our brand, it's always been diamonds that were never mined. Always cultured, never mined. 
From the beginning, and at just three years running now, the press and celebrities all over the world have been taking notice at this disrupting difference in diamonds that is Larkin Berry. So it's no wonder the Daily Mail came calling. But with Laura, I wanted to go back, way back, and learn about what inspired her to start Lark and Barry in the first place. The brand has had no shortage of press coverage, but we've been left wondering, what were the diamond seeds, if you will, in her past that gave her the idea to get into this game in the first place? And where did that name come from anyway, Lark and Barry? Turns out both the words have their own significance, and they came from someone who was very influential to Laura early on, a very special someone. I recall first hearing about this inspiration at the last team meeting in London just before COVID hit. Gosh, back in 2019, I guess it was. The last time everyone at Lark and Barry Worldwide was all together in person, Laura holding court and telling us of her grandmother, Delia, who made her own way through a difficult life, Laura had said, braving her hardest days with style and grace. You can find a picture of Delia on the blog about this podcast on the Lark and Barry website. Laura reminded me during our talk here that Delia gave her a necklace when she was very young. And it reminded me of a berry. So that's kind of something that I always remembered. And, you know, when I was looking for a name for the brand, why not have this special connection to my grandma? You know, she would never leave the house without being super elegantly dressed and with her beautiful necklaces and jewelry. Like, I just remember that about her. And what about the lark part? Yeah, so I'm Mexican. And lark in Spanish means, um, or is translated into alondra. And I've always liked that name. So, you know, whenever I have a first daughter, I'm going to name her that. But but also, when I discovered lark also means playful in English, I just really like that word. You know, I thought, here's this, like, bird that I like in the name in Spanish, but also it's playful. And I think everything we do, we should have fun doing. So that's where the word lark came about. And when I started combining words, lark and berry just sounded really nice. So I've always loved jewelry and I've always loved, you know, sparkly diamonds. But I never actually bought a diamond before, like ever. And that was because I watched... um, the movie Blood Diamond. I don't know, that movie really got to me. And I I would think, all right, I might really want a diamond, but you know, it's it's super expensive. Maybe I couldn't afford it back then. But also, what if I'm wearing this and you know, a, a kid somewhere might have lost their lives or it might have funded some sort of conflict. Like I just didn't know. And um, so I actually never bought a diamond. So you're into jewelry, you've seen Blood Diamond, that's around the time that maybe we're just getting out of, you're probably, uh, I'm roughly the same age as you, we're just kind of getting out of a undergraduate degree. So then you're entering a master's program for, for business in London, right? So when, when did it, between then and, and Larkin Berry's launch, what, what finally got you to, what finally gave you the idea for the brand and how did you, how did you really decide to launch it? Yeah, so um, I would say I came to London to do my MBA and that was in 2015. And during the MBA, you know, it's a time when you're, I guess, in the middle of maybe changing careers or figuring out what to do. And so I decided to take a jewelry course with a friend. We learned about the history of jewelry. So, you know, the professor started talking about jewelry, like in Egypt, through the Victorian era, the Black Diamonds, and then, you know, Art Deco just kind of like went through the history of it. Yeah. And she ended by saying, and now we can actually grow diamonds. And that's the first time I heard that. I was like, wait, what? What do you mean you can grow diamonds? And she told us, yeah, you can grow them. They're identical. Like you can guarantee where they're coming from. They can be way more sustainable as well. And, and, you know, that just, that, that was just amazing for me to hear because I thought, oh, wow, that means, you know, you can actually make sure no one was hurt in getting this diamond. So after that, I researched and there were not really any companies doing this. I mean, there were, there were globally, there were two companies that I found that were starting to sell these diamonds and, and engagement rings. But more than that, like there was just nothing. Well, you said there, you said there wasn't a designer brand only using cultured, right? No, there was no designer brands. It was just really like, you know, company one or two companies just making some rings for engagements where they offered these diamonds. So, so that's kind of what was there. And, and I thought, oh, wow, but you know, this has so much 
Like you can offer so much more because you can get amazing jewelry made. The diamonds, after they grow them, they have to be cut the exact same way. So they're going to last you just as long. They're going to shine just as much. They're just as hard. So I thought, why can't I do this? I should be doing this. This is amazing. Just like, wow, like you don't have to dig up any holes. There's no water pollution. You know, there's... um like no chemicals get leaked into the soil like it was just the benefits the benefits were clear as i've covered many times on this podcast and stay tuned for an upcoming culture diamonds 101 episode coming soon where we take a deep dive with gem experts culture diamonds are just the clear winner for planet earth so as laura tells it she found a niche be the first fine designer brand to offer culture diamonds and stones exclusively But it hasn't been all smooth sailing, changing the game, especially one that's been as long played as mining for diamonds, comes with a fight, whether you're looking for one or not. Lark and Barry since its launch has utilized tons of man hours creatively advertising with education about what culture diamonds are and how they're better for the planet than mine diamonds. And that has brought some controversy. The Daily Mail article literally opens with this. Quote, a few months after Laura Chavez set up her jewelry company in 2018, hate mail started arriving. One letter was, recalls Laura, signed by two important people in the UK jewelry industry, both men, presidents of organizations that I think readers would know. And she goes on. They went through everything on our website, outlining what was wrong, then threatened to take legal action. I had such a shock. A colleague said, you better watch your back. And the article goes on to ask, What had Laura done to cause such a reaction? Nothing illegal, she was assured by her lawyers. She had simply set up one of the world's first companies to sell jewelry made exclusively from lab-grown diamonds. So, I remember this predicament from the earliest days of Lark and Barry. You can still find a blog about it on the website titled, An Open Response to Those Trying to Intimidate Our Disruptive Diamond Industry. The two main shots mine diamond people took at Lark and Barry in this letter are actually very similar shots still fired by the very same people in Mine Diamonds today. They are, number one, the virtues of cultured diamond creation are exaggerated or false. And that, number two, disrupting cultured companies like Lark and Barry use terminology with intent to mislead luxury jewelry customers. The Mine Diamond Company's claims that cultured diamonds are actually less sustainable for the planet than Mine Diamonds stems from the DPA report released in 2019. That, if you don't recall, was a report commissioned by the Diamond Producers Association, or the DPA, a trade organization representing the world's largest diamond mining companies. It's been a heavily disputed report since its release, leaving out many factors such as exploratory digging and potential for human conflict, not to mention it's glossing over all the other environmental harms inherent to diamond mining that we just inherently don't find in culturing diamonds, like the polluting of groundwater and displacing of land and wildlife. I was reminded of another debacle Lark and Barry faced early on, which was, in effect, being stripped of a major award for design for a piece in one of the brand's early prize collections, the Bow Suite. The Bow Necklace had won the Graph Award for design and was then promptly stripped of it, the reasoning for which was never made clear. If you go back in time once again on Lark and Barry's blog, you can even see how back-to-back there was a post celebrating the win immediately followed by another discussing the strange reneging of the award shortly thereafter. Um, the, the person who made it, the artisan who made it in Hatton Garden, he asked us if we could if he could enter it into this competition to try to win the the graph award it was dedicated to you know a fine jewelry piece made of mostly diamonds basically so he entered it and it was with judges for about 30 days and i remember this because it was the Oscars time and we were trying to you know see who would wear a piece but then it was in London and we didn't know how to get it over there and people were going to be judging it but yeah so it was around that time I think February 2019 he ended up winning for this piece for this for the whole suite the bow suite because it's this you know this beautiful necklace and earrings and ring in kind of like a shape of a bow and it's full of diamonds set on platinum Right. And so he um, he won the award and he went, he accepted it. And after that, we promoted it. We we're like, oh, the artisan who made this Larkinberry piece, you know, wins for it. 
And it's, it's, it's so cool because this piece is made exclusively with cultured diamonds. And as soon as we announced that, um, they got so mad. I mean, they were like, you're not like, this is not your award and you shouldn't be saying this. And we were like, well, you know, we're not saying it's our award. We're saying his award, but it was for a piece, you know, he made for us. And it just kind of, um, well, you just, so- I mean, what you're saying is you're, you're basically left your, I mean, I remember, you know, they, well enough, like you're just kind of throwing your arms up in the air and going, well, what, what could this really be about? I mean, why would they, why would they get, so, why would there be so much pushback <clears throat> against you announcing an, an award win? And, you know, then you're, then are you looking at the, who, who were the judges and maybe who's involved in that decision making and seeing that it was probably um, a very mind diamond friendly kind of event? Cause I never said yeah, that I you guess, could use I culture guess, diamonds, yeah, they, right? No, it just said it had to have diamonds. You know, it didn't specify that diamonds had to be, you know, mined in Africa or Russia, or they could be grown. Like it just didn't say anything specifically. And so, so yeah, I, I do remember what you're saying. I just thought, why, like, why do they want us to not announce this? It's, it's actually really cool for, you know, when we're using grown diamonds and they just didn't like it. So I don't know, a few days later, the, the person who made the necklace just ended up giving the award back and, and that was it. But uh, I do think it doesn't matter where the diamonds come from. They're still diamonds and experts can't really tell anything apart like, because there's nothing to tell apart. Yeah. Well, and aside from that, and and since then, I mean, I know you've had, you've had people contact you directly for, for meetings that you've, that you've taken with, with various people that are, that are very obviously very affiliated with, with the interest of Mind Diamonds. And I, I know you told me once about, about meeting with someone from the Mind Diamonds industry that told you that they didn't like you using the term cultured and they, and they seemed to stress to you in a certain way that how different a product culture diamonds were than mine diamonds. Uh, I mean, what, do you want to speak to that in any way? Yeah. I mean, it's something that I don't really understand because, you know, some people do say, oh, it's, you know, despite, well, the mine diamond people say it's two totally different products. It just makes no sense to me because, you know, both diamonds are exactly the same. They're just as hard. They shine just as much. So last just as long, you know, once you grow them or once you mine them, you have to cut them to give them whatever shape you want. The the shine that you want, you know, polish them. I mean, they're identical. You show them to gemologists, they can't tell them apart. I mean, so so for me to say something is like a completely different product when they're literally the same thing, it just makes no sense. So that's something I've never been able to explain. You know, when when they tell me that, I just cannot explain that. Right. But, so um, someone, so someone, you know, that, that's very mind diamonds friendly, that's kind of, you know, imposing themselves on you in, in, in a way that's maybe however veiled or, or un, unveiled it is. I mean, they're obviously aware that both at this point that both diamonds are the same. And, you know, one could read, one could assume from that, from them contacting you in the first place that they're obviously have to be intimidated on some level by the fact that, that cultured is making you know, such waves in the market. And especially as time goes on, that's only becoming more and more the case, but they must also be, I mean, like you're, like you're saying, they're looking at it as two different diamonds. And the only thing, you know, I can, I would read into it beyond what I just said is that they think that there's still some kind of claim to, to rarity with mine diamonds or, or, and, or, you know, the emotional, emotional significance or worth they put into mine diamonds. I mean, do you think that's part of it too? And and what's your response to that kind of thinking? Yeah. So I think um, the emotional value also, I mean, that has to do with what each person puts into a diamond, right? So whether you're buying a mine diamond, a grown diamond, I think it's what it represents to you and to, and who you're going to give it to. So I don't think I can say like, this is better for your emotional value than this. Like, I, I just can't say that because it's a very personal choice. But um, when it comes to rarity, it's, you know, it's the whole diamond industry has always been really secretive. So, you know, you ask some people, oh, what happens when you run out of diamonds to mine, you know, and they'll say, oh, we still have, you know, 50, 60 years left. So they'll tell you stuff like that. So, so it's like, okay, so you can still keep mining. Are they rare? Are they not rare? Like, it's it's really hard to tell. I mean, I've seen so many documentaries. I've read so many things about how, you know, these big companies control the supply and they just keep it somewhere so then they can control the prices. You know, and it's 
who knows if it's real, if it's not, but you know, there's, there's so many secretive things about it that you just don't really know what's real and what's not. So what I say is, well, now we can grow a diamond, how it's even more beautiful to say, okay, I can grow this diamond with renewable energy. So I think like, what's like, what's more beautiful than that, you know, than saying we're actually still able to have this luxurious, beautiful product to wear, to gift. And then, you know, on top of that, it's actually helping clean up the air or, you know, it's growing with renewable energy. It's not displacing animals. It's not exploring somewhere else to start a new mine. And I think that's what I, I put more value in. Well, I don't get it even possibly more than you don't get it. Cause I mean, I'll just speak for myself, but I'm curious to hear your, your thought on it, but I just really don't understand. I mean, I, I get to the point sometimes where it makes me angry, not only at, you know, mine diamonds, mine diamonds companies, but also even just the idea of a consumer customer that I construct in my mind that just won't, you know, change their mind and realize that they're both the same diamond and, and not make the switch to culture. I mean, what what is your, do you get frustrated with, with the, any hesitance that's left in the consumer market? No, I think everyone has, you know, their rights for their right to make a choice and whatever they, they choose, that's, that's them. I think what's important is for us to tell them, you know, this is an option for us to, to show them what's available now. And as the technology progresses to also tell them, oh, by the way, now we can do this diamond this way. And, and I think it's, it's a matter of time before, you know, more people start learning about this and then start choosing a grown diamond instead of a, of a mind one. Luckily, Laura is the head of Larkin Berry and not me. And trust me, there is enough reasons it's good that's the case than we have time for in 10 podcasts. But she's just realistic, optimistic, and has a great level-headed view of the future. I'll just say it for me. I'm at a loss as to what the argument is for mine diamonds anymore. And the argument that people high up in that industry seem to keep falling back on. That because they're employing people in poor communities and putting money into those communities, and that's a good thing, of course. But how does that justify causing destruction to environments? How does it justify employing people to do a dangerous occupation when they have so few other choices? And all of this, when again, we know we have a better diamond for the planet and people now in cultured. It just makes me angry that mining continues. It makes me sad. And not that it doesn't bother Laura, of course, but she has such a responsible and nuanced take on it. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess it's, you know, everything has two sides to it and it's really hard to judge. But I, but I do think even, you know, yeah, let's, I, I think it's great that they're giving them jobs. I just think they should be also thinking about how they're going to keep giving these people jobs in the long term, you know, for their kids, their grandkids. I think that that's what I'm thinking about. And, and yeah, and like you said, the culture diamond people, we haven't, I mean, we're all really small, but even in, you know, being small, I think most of the companies that I know that are, you know, doing jewelry with culture diamonds, most of them try to help out in, in whatever way they can. You know, some have bracelets where you donate part of that to charity, you, you know, to some organizations, like we plant trees for purchases. So, so I think everyone's trying to do whatever they can in the size that they can. But you so do, it, you, it, it you, all adds up. You do see a future that's possible where, the bigger culture diamonds brands would get, the more they could help maintain communities and help employ people to do have new responsibilities in those in those uh, in those smaller communities around the world, right? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, it would be it would be amazing to be able to you know have labs in places around the world that need it the most, and you know, you're training people, you're teaching them you know, technical skills, you're going the whole community, then, then who's to say you don't have the whole, like everyone that you have from the person growing, cutting, polishing, but then you can also go and have, you know, the jewelry making person there. Right. So, you know, you have the whole, the whole chain there. Like who's to say that can't happen. Right. I've asked people in the industry, in the mine diamond industry, um, you know, when I first started, I remember asking them, uh, can you guarantee or tell me exactly where this diamond is coming from? And it wasn't just one person. And several people would say, honestly, like, I can't tell you 100% where it's been or where it came from, because it passed through like, dozens of hands. You right. know, and, and I heard this a few times. So, so I'm sure the bigger companies that control everywhere from every like the whole supply chain from mine all the way to jewelry, I'm sure they can probably guarantee no one died and that it's ethical and all that stuff. I'm sure they can do that. But you know, there's still 
lots of diamonds out there that come from not the big companies that could potentially still be leading to conflicts. I see a great opportunity here for you know people in certain parts that are mining that are making their living off of mining. I think um, you know mines will at some point run out. I don't know if you know this, but in Sierra Leone, uh, you know when mining that when they found diamonds, you know all these people rushed in, they mined all the diamonds and you know took them all out. And when they left, they left Sierra Leone worse than it was before that. So the people there, they're poorer than ever. They didn't really see any benefits from this diamond rush. So why don't we start, you know, putting in place other ways for these people to keep their current diamond jobs? So it could be anywhere from, let's start building labs. And when you're building labs, you you need, you know, obviously you need scientists, you need, you know, people with certain technical skills, but you also need people who are going to, you know, maintenance cleaning, you know, transportation for other people. I mean, there's there's still a lot of things that could happen there. And after the the mining process, everything is the same. You know, so if you have that supply chain now where you mine the diamond, you get the raw piece, then after that, you still have the growers, the poly I mean, sorry, you still have the um, cutters, the cutters, the polishers, the people who test them, the people who make the certificates, you know, like that, everything else after the raw part is still the same. So why not make the whole thing sustainable for, you know, five generations from now, you know, so even if a mine dries out, then you still have that process going and the people there don't have to even think, you know, what's going to happen to me when we don't have diamonds to mine anymore. Laura mentioned that even a year ago, labs she would talk to would say they were growing with around 10% renewable energy. And again, there's plenty of evidence you can find out there doing your research that even that amount is better than mining. And though 10% is a far cry from someone like Diamond Foundry's 100%, Diamond Foundry is just one company doing great things. But of course, not everyone can work with one diamond grower. And so the good news is, Laura told me that now she talks to labs and she's way more commonly seeing that they're growing with 50% or more renewable energy. And as this market for cultured diamonds continues to grow and the demand just keeps increasing all across the board for producing products in a way that best combats climate change. I mean, the market will demand that all labs be completely renewable. And that demand comes from people, the customers, like maybe you who's listening and supporting sustainable products, the people who want diamond jewelry made the best way for the planet. And so there's a UK lab you're working with that can make that makes some of your diamonds with with those ultra sustainable methods. And you've worked with Diamond Foundry to make the piece that Billy Porter uh, worked war, war for the Oscars. And then also in the Daily Mail article, you mentioned something about diamonds being grown from the sky and how that's a partnership that you're kind of eyeing. Are you able to talk much about that or say much about what might come of that yet? Yeah, so we're um, we're still talking to this company, but they um, they have this technology where they can grab excess carbon from the air and they can convert that into a diamond. So you know, I always tell people you're literally you know you're, you're it's raining diamonds. <laughs> You know, because you can just grab them, grow them, and then, you know, you have this beautiful diamond grown with renewable energy that is also, I would say, negative carbon. I think it's it's really cool, and and it's the future. This cultured thing, it's just such a revolution. It's really exciting to be part of it. Before I let Laura go, I wanted to know if she had an instance to relate to me of where she experienced a customer or customers that had taken to cultured in a way that left her feeling particularly inspired, that perhaps left her feeling like she was really seeing things change. People always ask, like, what type of customers like cultured diamonds? And my response is always like, well, anyone that likes diamonds and wants something shiny in their jewelry, because, um, like our customers aren't aren't particularly like just one type of customers. I mean, we have anywhere from, you know, young girls, you know, guys buying gifts for girls to, you know, this one time we had, um, we had this family, which was a generation of three women, the daughter, the mom and the grandma, and they all came to get a piercing in our store. And I think the daughter must have been like in her mid 20s, you know, the mom probably like 50s and the grandma was like around 80. So that was really cool, you know, just to see this big generation of 
of people all into just the experience and you know the diamonds they were cool with like they really wanted them i don't know it's just really exciting to you know for people to to know this is an option they have now and you know and hopefully we can help them out to create their dream jewelry piece, dream ring, whatever it is, like we're just here to make a lot of people happy with an emotional purchase that they can have, you know, for the rest of their lives and even their kids' lives. I know they did a little something at least to to help the planet. Yeah, or just yeah, that they have this option now that you know every little thing matters and it all adds up to to make something great. Well, I want to thank Laura so much for joining me. Really, such a long time coming. Please subscribe on your chosen platform. We're doing our best to release episodes more frequently. Lark and Barry wants everyone to learn more about Culture Diamonds, the more environmentally responsible option in diamonds. We want everyone to know that you have a choice now in buying luxury jewelry, and that there is only one choice that's truly sustainable for the future, and that's Culture Jewelry, whether it's diamonds, emeralds, or sapphires. Subscribe to The Diamond Disruptor on your chosen platform for podcasts. And please rate and review us. Go to larkandberry.com to shop. And follow Lark and Barry on social media at Lark and Barry.